those with faith also understand that once God's judgments begin in earnest, there is no turning back, no time for repentance, only time for justice. The result will be Armageddon. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Spiritual Survival Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Brown. Our team's mission is to help you have eyes to see the times we are living in, take unprecedented measures to prepare yourself spiritually for the events that will precede the second coming of Jesus Christ. If the mission of our podcast resonates with you, please click subscribe, like, and share this content. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's edition of Spiritual Survival. I have a guest today that I'm super excited to have on with us. It's Richard Draper. Many of you may know him as uh, having been a professor at BYU in uh, the religious department. And his topic today is going to be the revelation of John the Apostle, which uh, I am super excited about. Just by way of uh, a background, uh, uh, Richard started teaching seminary many, many years ago. I, I resonate with him on that. I took that same path at one point. And uh, had his eye on BYU, but felt like that probably wasn't, uh, there wasn't a very good chance of that. Um, and then he, he taught Institute for 18 years and uh, had a little bit of a break there where he became part of the curriculum staff and then got his PhD. And uh, his dream was kind of fulfilled by being accepted at BYU and uh, taught religion 22 years at BYU and uh, ended his career as the associate dean. So, uh, Richard, welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. So uh, back in in 2020, when everything was going crazy, uh, not that it's that much less crazy now. <laughs> not that it stopped, uh, right? Yeah. Uh, my wife and I, and I've shared this on some past podcasts, we, we kind of had a spiritual awakening. Um, we kind of felt this... Uh, very strong spiritual um, prompting to prepare not only temporally, but spiritually. And part of that is I, I felt a strong impression that I should, should start studying Isaiah and uh, the book of Revelation, as well as uh, dive deeper into some of the types in the book of Mormon that, that uh, talk about our day. And, uh, during that time in, in 2020, I, I came across some YouTube videos on the book of Revelation done by Richard Draper, <laughs> which I I really loved. At that point, I did not know much about the book of Revelation. Um, but uh, about a month ago, I was down at BYU Education Week and had the privilege of uh, attending Brother Draper's uh, classes on the, on, on the book of Revelation there. And... Uh, so it, this is something that's really strongly on my heart. It's uh, uh, I almost feel uh, commanded, maybe in the way Nephi was commanded to build a ship, <laughs> to to really start learning these things and uh, and seeing them from you know where we are now. So, uh, Brother Draper, welcome. Uh, I know you have some slides you can share. Um, how did you get into studying uh, apocalyptic materials in the first place? How did you? <laughs> <laughs> Very good question. I am by nature uh, an insecure person. Uh, therefore, I like to uh, plan my days and know what I'm doing in advance. My wife says that I live by my day planner. Uh, when uh, when I was in the 11th grade uh, new, uh, in seminary, we studied the New Testament and our teacher, Brother McKenna, the last, second to last class period brought up the book of Revelation. Uh, my, I was not raised in an active LDS family, uh, therefore was um, kind of illiterate so far as uh, scriptures and so on were concerned, but I did enjoy seminary. And when he taught me about Revelation and the fact that God has revealed the future, I was really excited. And so um, after class one day, right toward the end of the semester, I talked to him about how can I know more about this prophecy stuff? And he said, well, if you're planning on going to college, 
uh, you can take uh, religion courses, and if you take New Testament, you'll learn about the book of Revelation. So uh, I would anxiously went to uh, BYU. Uh, I got through my Book of Mormon material, which was uh, required. Uh, and then I did not take religion uh, 211, which is the first half of the New Testament. I did eventually, but not initially. I took the second half, 212, and uh, anxious to get to know the book of Revelation. We made it to uh, First Peter. Oh, no. I was deeply disappointed. So not to be outdone in those days, they had advanced uh, religion for undergraduates. So I took 412, and we actually made it to Jude. So my two attempts at college uh, failed. Not to be outdone, when I was working on my master's degree out of Arizona State, I was up here doing research in the uh, church uh, library as well as the BYU library. And that summer they had um, a course, a uh, graduate course, 512 on the book of Revelation. So I, aud I uh, audited that course and we actually got to Revelation the very last day. But did the teacher talk about Revelation? No, he had one of the students read a paper that he had written, the, the uh, teacher really liked. And it was on interpretations of the book of Revelation. How does one understand the book? Do we use the historious method, the, uh, I should say, the historical methodist, the preterist method, the, um, uh, uh, the symbolic method, just how do we do? Uh, quite frankly, I found it uh, both, the paper both interesting and terribly disappointing. It looked like I would never learn to uh, uh, be able to get into the book of John. Fast forward to my PhD program. Uh, it was summer, uh, and uh, I was doing my advanced Greek work. So we were taking five and six hundred levels of um, Greek courses. The uh, instructor was Richard L. Anderson, and um, there were only two of us in the class. Brother Anderson was very student-oriented, and so he said, well, uh, this is the Koine class. Uh, Koine is the literature, uh, is the dialect of the New Testament, uh, the Septuagint, the early Christian fathers. He says, is there anything you'd like? We got a lot of literature here we can choose from. And I said, um, would it be possible to do the book of Revelation? And Brother Anderson said, yes, it wouldn't be quite enough. Uh, we'd have to do some more. So we chose Second Clement, which is also apocalyptic. So I spent that summer with another of my graduate students, and we we uh, translated uh, the entire book of Revelation. And as we did so, there was all kinds of information that was going in. And I kept a little notebook of everything that was going on, all my insights and ideas. Um, and I just kept that little spiral notebook uh, in, in my office after I graduated. Uh, I, be, I was, well, before I graduated, I was called as bishop. Uh, I determined I was so tired of academics by that time, I wasn't going to take another test in my life and was loath to write much. But I was sitting in my home office one evening uh, when that little notebook whistled to me. I was very busy being bishop. And so I said, well, uh, someday I'm going to get to that. Uh, but it kept whistling. And finally, one night when I was done, I pulled that little notebook down and I just opened it up and was reading some things. And these ideas just started to flow. So I began to capture them. And that evening, I wrote about six pages, uh, um, just uh, pulling things together. And that started it. And for, from there, I just uh, continued to learn, uh, delve into apocalyptic, into the ancient society. Um, and just really get a feel for the book. It seems like that was destiny almost. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what ideas have you come to that uh, could, could be important to us here in the last days? Well, yeah, that, uh, I, that's really, really good question. Uh, kind of uh, putting the good stuff up front, which I really like to do. Uh, four ideas. The first is that prophecy changes the complexion of the present. Now, what, what I mean by that, uh, the, if we don't know what the future is, 
then if we're wise, we we use the present to prepare for that future. In my case, uh, I wanted to eventually end up at BYU, and therefore I got a master's degree. Uh, I got a PhD and was able to end up at BYU. Uh, when the future is known, we prepare for the future the future but we know what to prepare for yeah and therefore knowing what the future holds allows us in the present to really focus on what we need to do in order to be prepared for the future so that's kind of my first takeaway on that one uh the second one is that uh things are not going to get better uh, that's very pessimistic uh, view, but as I've studied the scriptures, um, it is interesting that the positive prophecies are all, uh, but uh, yeah, they're all unconditional. Um, the church is going to be restored, is being restored. Uh, the church is going to be spread across the land, so its numbers will are few. It will be ubiquitous. Uh, the, Israel will be gathered. Zion will be built. Jesus will come, and there will be a millennial reign. I mean, that's just flat out what's going to happen. The most of the bad scriptures are conditional. That is to say, they will happen only if the conditions are met. And um, uh, the end result of that is if bad happens, it's not God's fault because he's told us what is going to happen. Therefore, we could prepare for what happens. And if we don't, um, he has uh, no responsibility. He gave it to us and we, we botched the job. Uh, one example of a, a prophet, that I'm going to have to be a little cautious on this one because it caught my attention many, many years ago. A prophecy caught my attention many, many years ago. And I have really wondered about it. This is found in 3 Nephi 16 and 21, in which uh, Jesus, well, let me just uh, read what it says. It says, if the Gentiles shall sin against my gospel and a remnant, likely the L Lamanites, uh, will be among them as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who, if they go through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none shall deliver. Their hand shall be lifted up upon their adversaries, and their enemies shall be cut, cut off. Uh, now, that possibly could come through in the future, but I think what that's one where the Gentiles, yeah, there was some opposition, pretty heavy opposition against the church, but the conversion rate just continued and continued and continued. And therefore, uh, as I see it, that's one prophecy never came true. True. So in that light, um, we don't have to go through the bad stuff, but what it requires is people doing that which is right. Uh, the third item, uh, and this, this one is quite important to me. Uh, I have found that many modern interpreters assume that uh, the modern era was John's primary target. And we must keep in mind that we are not his primary target. His primary target was them there and now, not us here at this time. And therefore, as we're interpreting Revelation, we have to say, what did it mean to them? What was John trying to teach them? What did they get out of it? And then we can say, okay, now we understand that. What do we get out of it? Uh, that uh, we are going to get a little later in this podcast into the mark of the beast, I trust. Um, and uh, a lot of people have come up with all kinds of modern names uh, the, uh, I get emails and people share things with me. And uh, Ronald Reagan is one that some people feel. Uh, Barack Obama is one that people feel uh, was the beast and so on. And so it goes. But uh, these are all modern and none of them really work in the context of the book of Revelation. We must look elsewhere for the answer. And finally, the, the fourth point is that knowing the future, we're coming full circle here. Knowing the, what the future will hold allows us to prepare for today 
And I would say that we've got two important missions when all is said and done. It is to prepare. We know what's going to happen. We know it's not going to be good. Uh, we also know we're led by living prophets, and therefore uh, they will lead us uh, exactly as, as what we're supposed to do. And we can survive through this era uh, very, very nicely. Um, and our primary focus there should be then preparation. And this is a big one to me proselytization. We know things are going to get bad. It seems to me that knowing that our outreach as Latter-day Saints should be to gather all the people we can and then bring them into the kingdom. So th those are some takeaways that uh, as I've studied Revelation, I came to really feel quite strongly about. So would you say that uh, we're the secondary audience? Yes. Uh -huh. the, the, the people in John's day were the primary audience. Okay. So, uh, you know, I, one thing that stands out to me is President Nelson saying that uh, we're living in the day that Nephi saw in vision. Yes. And so, uh, you know, Nephi has shared some of those things, but he, he was told to stop. That There was another <laughs> guy by the name of John who would tell us what those things are. And so it seems to me it would be important to uh, to know what John's saying. <laughs> yes. Uh, to know what what Nephi couldn't say, and uh, that we're living in those times. <laughs> yes, exactly right. Is that, yeah, is that I, th I think uh, uh, the, revel the book is particularly relevant for us right now, but we do have to interpret it correctly. Yeah. So uh, I know Lef uh, Nephi saw the, the church of the lamb, and he saw the church of the devil. He saw the covenant people armed with power and great glory. And... Uh, so yeah, I'm, prophet's telling us this. So <laughs> it's yep. uh, now's the time our... to be prepared. If we're prepared, <laughs> as it, six, it says in section, what is it? Section uh, uh, thirty-eight thirty. If you're prepared, you shall not fear. Yeah. Well, share with us uh, some of the things from your presentation. Uh, very good. Okay. Um, uh, just talking about apocalyptic itself. Uh, and I'm going to pull up a slide here. Uh, is that visible? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, prophecy uh, is, uh, is like, uh, excuse me, let me start again. Apocalyptic, like prophecy, is predictive. But each one of them plays by its own rules. Prophecy shows the future as it arises out of the present, such that the historical flow is not interrupted. Now let's take Isaiah, for example. Isaiah says, okay, uh, Israel, you're not being good, and therefore you're going to be hammered by the Assyrians. But uh, as you repent, why the Lord will be with you. Uh, if you rebel, you're going to be hammered by the Babylonians, but you're going to come back and so on. We just uh, see this uh, ebb and flow of uh, history. Apocalyptic is interested in the end time. It asks the questions, why does the age end as it does? What, uh, what will cause that end to be and what will come after that end? Therefore, it is a uh, predictive but it focus on the future when God breaks into history, disrupts it, and starts a brand new beginning. So the focus is exclusively on the end time. So though uh, John's prophecy does give us some uh, some historical background and some context as to the way the way history has gone, its real its focus really is on the last days and those last things that are going to come. Uh, also, apocalyptic plays by its own rules, and these rules uh, do not conform to a uh, past or a present reality. Uh, it comes up with its own means of being able to interpret what's going on through the power of symbols. For example, uh, Revelation divides history uh, into seven 1,000-year periods. Uh, each of which has specific things assigned to that thousand-year period. But as we 
step back and move out of the apocalyptic imagery, history, it, it, it's, it's not nice, neat, cut and dry, uh, 7,000 year periods. Uh, history as it really is, is really messy. But for John's sake, uh, and we're going to get into numbers in a bit, I trust, um, breaking it down into seven periods is a message for us. And that is seven represents the fullness, the uh, time in which God operates. And so uh, the, the number says God is going to operate through the entire length of this period of time. <clears throat> and therefore, we're not to ever feel abandoned that God is going to be with us uh, through, the, through the whole time. Uh, very often I'm asked, uh, so which seal are we in? Are we in the sixth seal? Are we in the seventh seal? Uh, we're really uh, asking the wrong question. Uh, Revelation is a model, and it's a very good model, and we can learn from that model about the reality and the reality of our own day, but we have to keep in mind it's still a model. And by saying uh, which... Um, which seal are we in? It's kind of like saying in the model, which seat am I in? Well, we're not in a seat. That's a model. And we use the model to learn about the future and therefore what we can we can do about, the, about that future. So uh, apocalyptic uses, uses symbols, uh, but it uses symbols in a very graphic kind of way. Uh, it's a roller coaster ride, and, and many of our your viewers are going to be familiar with the book of Revelation and know that, uh, boy, the images are incongruous. They are wild. Some are even nightmarish. And uh, we say, what in the world's going on here? But we have to remember that apocalyptic literature is like a riddle. It was never meant for the pen or the brush. It was never meant to be painted. In fact, you can't do it. Uh, considering the uh, beast from the sea comes out, it has uh, uh, 10 horns and uh, seven crowns. And so we have to, or it has seven heads, 10 horns and 10 crowns. And so we have to ask ourselves, well, which, which horns go with which head? Does one head have all of the thorns, all of the horns, or do some have one and some have three? And the, an the answer is no, don't, don't do that. What do the symbols tell us about the forces in the last days? So it's a riddle. And what Be Revelation does is it asks us to engage in the riddle. For example, uh, we see the Son of Man, flaming eyes, uh, uh, fiery legs, and so on. And, and this is chapter one, by the way. And from his mouth issues a, a, a two-edged sword. Uh, boy, that, that one is really kind of hard to draw. It's also kind of hard to imagine. But again, it's a riddle. And the revelation, the revelator is asking us to interpret the riddles. Now, it's helpful, again, knowing uh, that John did not create or God did not create the, uh, the images ex nihilo. They are part of the culture of the the uh, Judeo, probably should say the Greco-Roman world with heavy emphasis on the Jewish component of that. And so as we get into the Greco-Roman world and really take a look at the Jewish component, then we're able to understand these symbols, interpret those symbols, figure out the riddle. And then we say, how does that apply to us today? And boy, does it apply to us. Um Let's see, just looking at my notes here. So go ahead. I've heard, I've, I've heard people ask, you know, did John see the vision in, in that apocalyptic way or did he just describe it in that apocalyptic way? Yes, uh, and that's a very good question. Uh, the, and the answer is there in the first chapter when John assures his reader that I was very careful to record everything which I saw. And therefore, uh, John does not make up the imagery. The imagery has shown him, has shown to him. But again, within the context of his culture and that of those who will be receiving the letter. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, the next thing is just to talk about, uh, in addition to these wild and exaggerated symbols, 
just something came to just jumped into my mind. Very often, the it is the incongruity that forces us to really take a look and in looking find the power of the imagery. Let me just use one example. There's hundreds in there. But in chapter five, we see a lamb that is slain. And the Greek word means, I mean, it is a wound from, from neck to neck, the way they sacrificed uh, animals. And so we have a lamb, but the lamb is standing. And so we, we see that incongruity. How can it be dead or at least bear the marks of death and yet be standing? And here's a, a beautiful there's a beautiful answer in the riddle, and that is, this is Jesus Christ. And though he bar bears the marks of the crucifixion in his hands and sides and feet, he is yet alive. And therefore, to me, the message is, death cannot conquer Christ, cannot conquer God. And so that, that's the way we play the game. We uh, go through and interpret the symbols and look for the incongruities as well as the congruities and thereby are able to really understand what's going on within the context. Um, apocalyptic literature, uh, another slide I've got here, shows that humankind's attempt to create a peaceful future by overcoming weakness will fail miserably and utterly. This literature unites in witnessing that the consumption will come from outside the flow of history and thereby disrupt it, bringing about a new creation and order. And the standard works agree with apocalyptic literature. Uh, it, things are not gonna get better, things are gonna be worse, but knowing that we know how to prepare. Uh, in addition to symbols, or rather, I should say, along with symbols, uh, the book of Revelation and apocalyptic literature in general uses the qualitative me me meaning of numbers. We're, we're familiar with the, qual uh, the quantitative, two plus two equals four. But when we talk about the qualitative meaning, two plus two doesn't equal four, it tells us something. So again, uh, I put this together on a slide. One third is the remnant, that which is either destroyed or preserved. The number one equals God, two equals witnesses, three equals Godhead, four represents geographical wholeness, six imperfection, seven that which is whole, complete, total. Uh, and for a long time, if you read uh, literature before uh, 1990, uh, the idea of perfection was part of seven, but there's been a lot of study done on that, and um, uh, it no longer has that perfective quality. Yes, it still does with God, but it represents what he brings to completion, but not the element of perfection. That's in another number. Going on, 10 equals the whole of a part, and some people uh, struggle with that one. What does it mean, the whole of a part? Uh, the example I use is how many tribes uh, were taken by the Assyrians. And we all know the answer, 10 tribes, right? Mm -hmm. But then as we really take a look at things, we find that Simeon, Judah, and Benjamin were all in the South. And three from 12 doesn't make 10, makes nine. Further, uh, there was a purge of Jehovah worshipers in the Northern area under Rehoboam uh, and others. And a whole lot of those tribes moved south uh, and therefore mingled with uh, the, uh, the southern kingdom. Therefore, uh, Lehi is a Manassehite. Uh, so the number 10 represents all those guys that were taken uh, by the Assyrians, okay? And it's not, uh, if, we shouldn't say so which 10 tribes were taken and which weren't because what it's really saying is it represents all those people who were taken. So when we run into 10 in the, uh, in the um, book of Revelation, it means 100% of that fraction going on then. 12 equals priesthood. 40 is a period of trial ending in victory. 40 is a good number. 
uh, Moses goes up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, comes back with the Ten Commandments. Jesus uh, goes into the wilderness 40 days, 40 nights, uh, comes out, begins his ministry. So 40 is a good number. 42 is not a good number. 42 is uh, the period in which evil dominates. Uh, the, the similar symbols are 1,260, uh, which is the number of days in three and a half years uh, in the Jewish solar, uh, lunar solar calendar. Also, times, time and a half time all come together in that number 42, a period in which evil dominates. And then 1,000 represents perfection. What we do now is we can combine all of these and by using gematria, the study of the qualitative meaning of numbers, we can uh, learn lessons. So let me just give one example of many that could uh, we could use. We uh, found out that three represents Godhead and four represents the earth. By timesing three and four, we get 12. Now 12 is the priesthood number. So God's power on the earth equals the priesthood. We will meet in the book of Revelation two groups of 144,000. So taking 12 and multiplying itself uh, shows the just the quality, uh, the power of the priesthood. So 12 is what priesthood with the lower P. Uh, 12 times 12, 144 is priesthood with a capital P. And then by tacking on the thousand or timesing it by a thousand, this is priesthood whole, complete and total. And that is the priesthood that is now operating here in these last days. So, uh, so that's not the uh, same as the fullness of the priesthood? Uh huh. Yeah. It? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So we see, we see that power, uh, see the power of the numbers as we work through Revelation. Let me just check my notes again. Yeah, okay. Uh, one of the questions that uh, is fre frequently asked is, why did God give revelation through prophetic uh, uses rather than apocalyptic uses? And you mentioned uh, 2 Nephi 13, and 2 Nephi 13 and 14 do supply the answer, and that is we've got the great and abominable out there. And one of the things that the great and abominable does is it really messes up the scriptures so that uh, people can be led astray. Mm -hmm. But God's got to get this message in Revelation, not only from his primary audience, but also to his secondary audience because of the good it will do them. So what does he do? He puts it in code. An apocalyptic is that code. And by putting it in code, uh, he preserves it. It is interesting that there are, uh, textually, there are really quite a few variants in the book of Revelation, but what struck me as I was translating it is there is not a single variant that in any way changes the meaning of a single verse in the whole thing. There are little picky variants along the way, but putting it in code really worked. Uh, it got uh, John's message to us exactly the way Heavenly Father wanted uh, it to get to us. So, so uh, I'm saying that the book really can be trusted. It, it came down without, a, without much interference by the great and abominable. Uh, the second point in that regard is not only do we, do we have a, a scripture that came to us intact as it should have, but also it is God's playbook. We know how the plays are going to run. We also have Satan's playbook. And for sports enthusiasts, if a person has the other team's playbook, <laughs> the team with the other guy's playbook is going to win. And we have the playbook. We also have living prophets and apostles and the scriptures. One of the things that impressed me reading the literature, um, uh, non-LDS, but uh, of people, good Christian people who really believe, um, I was impressed that we as Latter-day Saints really have the edge. 
Uh, due to the restoration, we understand how certain symbols can be interpreted. Through the Doctrine and Covenants, we have D&T 77 as, the, of course, the key to the interpretation of the Revelation. But with sections 88, uh, there are just a whole uh, group of them there that really help us understand this book uh, in a way that is that helps the message come through with even more force. Uh, I just uh, resonated with that so so very, very much. So that's that's kind of where we're down to so far as the introduction is concerned. So as far as the numbers we see in in the book of Revelation, um, I mean, should should we be using those numbers to calculate things? Is it, in your opinion, is it more? more symbolic than it is you know literal numbers or oh i'm really glad you asked that question i am uh let's interpret the numbers rather than try and figure out what they are uh what what something is i i think we need to understand them as riddles and we figure out the riddles let me give you one example uh and there was silence in the heavens for about a half hour right um, knowing uh, in in Peter's writings, one day equals a thousand years. And therefore I say, okay, if one day is a thousand years, how long is a half hour? About 27 years or something like that. And so there's going to be a 27 year period of silence, uh, about a 27 year period of silence, if I've done the math right in my head. Um and so the question then is, what does that mean there's going to be no revelation during that period of time or that revelation is going to happen to the church during that period of time? A lot of speculation on that. But if we take a look at what that meant in John's day, and particularly as we look at the uh, Old Testament, a period of silence, we find a period of silence consistently associated with heaven's pained response to the wickedness of man that uh, and then uh, the unleashing of that pain uh, through the coming of the judgments of God so I don't I, I get a little nervous when we say well it's so many years I'd much rather say this is heaven's pained response to man's iniquity and that it forebodes rather than a period of time a warning that things are going to get really bad really soon. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> one of the things the book does is it exposes the great enemies. And John does this, interestingly, through two sets of symbols. The uh, first is the evil triumvirate of Satan, the dragon, and the false messiah, the false lamb the lamb with two horns satan of course the instigator he is the one who moves things along the beast is the power he supplies the uh, the the um, muscle and the lamb is the propaganda minister and the three of them work together and do an excellent job and uh, considering those i wrote the following they can imitate the uh, they uh, what they do is imitate by deception the true Godhead. As the sun has his two witnesses, so too the dragon has his two monsters. As the sun draws power from the father, so too the first beast draws authority from the dragon. As the Holy Ghost glorifies the sun, so too the evil lamb glorifies the first beast. There is little doubt but that John exposed them in symbolic terms as the counterfeit Godhead, the beguiling revelators, the false lawgivers whose power will rule in the last days. So that's one set of um, symbols dealing with the forces of evil in the last days. The other set is the great seductress Babylon, the uh, mother of iniquity and her steed. Here the focus is on the seductive power that operates in the last days and, and with how beguiling it is, how it can suck people in uh, to, to its world to really believe 
uh, somehow in what is being said um, uh, or at least propagated uh, by the powers of Babylon. And boy, I'll tell you, we are, we are really living during that period of time. Babylon is everywhere. Um, again, just taking a look at this particular symbolism, Babylon and her steed, I have written the following written the following, John lays before the reader the terrifying prospect of an economic system completely dominated by what has been called the mechanic principle. Uh, that actually comes from Hugh Nibley. I don't know if anybody used it before him, but that's where I picked it up. Uh, Satan, who stands as an imitator of this system, first revealed its great secret to Cain, who in turn revealed it to his followers. Uh, from Moses 5, 29 through 31, and he, Satan, did plot with Cain and his followers from that time forth. And then from Helaman 6, 27, uh, it shows us that the objective of all that plotting was to learn the trade of term, turning human life into property. Evil and conspiring men formed the secret combination initially, which then swept across the oceans and survived through times. And Satan, again, uh, he lives in 630, doth hand down their plots and their oaths and their covenants and their plans of awful wickedness from generation to generation, according as he can get hold of the hearts of the children of men. So here we see then the um, power of Babylon and its propaganda minister being able to change uh, the dynamic of society such that instead of loving people, we love things. And once we love things, it's very, uh, very easy to use people to get things. And the greatest immorality in the world is when we use things, or excuse me, when we, we use people to get things and therefore discard people. And we, we, we see that happening all over the place. It, it just uh, makes my heart sick when I see some of these things uh, going by. It sounds like uh, watching the news and uh, listening to talk radio. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it really does. And uh, we see this right now, there's a, a strike going on with the uh, uh, auto workers of America uh who uh earning earning uh 15 to 25 to 30 dollars an hour where the executive top executives are earning millions uh you know that disparity where people use people and are willing to use people up in order to get what the uh, wealthy want so it, yeah it's a very very sad world which my, then brings us go ahead oh my one of my sons works for uh operation underground railroad oh yes and, uh, he's on a a mission right now down in uh not not an lds mission <laughs> yeah mission right with, uh, with, uh, uh underground, operation railroad, underground railroad in panama right now and uh you know when i he tells me about some of the things he's exposed to it's it's just unbelievable it's uh makes you sick breaking doesn't, doesn't even yeah it's just sickening and it seems to me that's a great example of uh, using people. Oh, uh, that that is a perfect example uh, of that. Uh, when I've taught this uh, course uh, at BYU, I sometimes, uh, I, I not sometimes, I will ask the students, so, so what do you see uh, out there uh, that uh, would qualify uh, as uh, these institutions that, the, that Babylon the Great uses? And uh, they will get the tobacco industry. They will get the um, liquor industry. Uh, then they, they can get a little wild. Um, the, the, um, I said the Queen of Denmark is supposed to be over some kind of organization. Or there's the Illuminati or the Trilateral Commission. They go in all of these, which means nothing to John and his people. We can discount them pretty much out, uh, out of hand. But nonetheless... What is really there is people who use people in order to get things. And it, it is everywhere. Uh, my uh, son-in-law, for example, uh, had car trouble. 
So he went to mechanic A and mechanic A said, well, it's, it's your transmission. Uh, it'll cost you $3,000. So he went to a friend, uh, also a mechanic, and the guy looked at it and says, no, what you've got is you've got a valve that is misreading. It'll cost you $150. And they fixed it for $150. So we see that sort of thing, you know, people cheating, uh, just taking advantage of other people. And all of these belong to that cabal uh, of the beast, okay? They fall under the power of Babylon the Great. Uh, one of the uh, areas of revelation of which there has been more ink spilled than any other, of course, is the mark of the beast. And I thought we might uh, conclude just taking a look at the mark of the beast since a lot of people have interest in, uh, in that. So just taking a look, uh, everybody knows the number of the beast is 666. Uh, ancient societies used letters for numbers. They did not have, as we do, a number system separate from the alphabetical system. And therefore, A equals 1, J equals 10, K equals 20, L 30, S equals 100, and, and on it goes. Uh, most are familiar with the Roman numerals where uh, I equals 1 and V equals 5 and X equals 10. L is 50, uh, C is 100, D uh, actually, yeah, D is 500, isn't it? Yeah, and M a, M a thousand. Now, what that means is that names can be translated into numbers. You just simply take a person's name and uh, you, you uh, codify it. Uh, into a number system, and uh, any name can be represented by a number. Uh, when it comes to the beast and the mark of the beast, uh, we have uh, what um, the Greek word is haragma, and haragma is associated with another word, character, which means character. That's where we get character from. And it means an outward form, the image, the outward appearance of something. And it came to denote mammon, that is money. Uh, I, I hear quite often people associate mammon with Satan. <laughs> it's not probably a bad association, but mammon doesn't have anything to do with Satan. It, it is just, it is money that hasn't yet been sorted into uh, dimes, nickels, and quarters. It's just this chest of mammon is mm -hmm. called money, mammon. Uh, and um, the reason that uh, money became associated uh, with haragma is because the emperor's image was placed on it. But one of the things that uh, I discovered that really resonated with me as I was working through this is that uh, the word haragma actually initially meant the serpent's bite. So you could tell uh, why a person was sick as you searched the person and found the certain spot, uh, the bite of the servant where the, the, the poison actually got in to the, the individual. Uh, therefore, as I see it, the mark of the beast is not physical, but rather it is spiritual. It's not tattoos or implants or barcodes. It symbolizes the worship of the beast by which one thinks his thoughts and does his deeds because the mark is worn on that in the forehead. So thinking uh, the beast's ways or on the hand doing what the, uh, what the beast does. Um, so uh, 666, the uh, solution is extremely difficult because it is riddled with problems. First of all, there's a manuscript variant. Most have 666, but a significant number have 616. So is the lesser, uh, did the lesser manuscripts get it right or did the majority of manuscript manuscripts get it right? Uh, uh, another one is, uh, it, do, we, do we use Greek system? Uh, to figure out the number, do we use the Hebrew system? Uh, do we use the Latin system? Okay, are we going to use Latin numbers? Are we going to use Greek numbers? Are we going to use Hebrews numbers uh, on that one? Uh, also, there's the problem, just the name, the, 
um, it is the number of a man. Well, the Greek it, it means it could be the number of an individual, but it also means it could be a human as opposed to a divine number. And uh, I don't want to uh, get your audience all confused on that one, but let me just simply say there is just so much going on that it is hard to get used to. But let's take a look at uh, some of the ones that are um, interesting, okay, that play a part. Uh, the most popular is Nero. Nero is the beast. Uh, and this works if we take the word uh, Caesar Nero and we transliterate it into Hebrew and we uh, put that into Greek characters, it comes out as 666. So uh, if we take uh, Nero then and use the Greek letters, it comes out 60, 60, 666. Interestingly enough, if we translate it into Latin, it comes out 616. So those manuscripts that have 616 suggest that it's looking at Nero. Those with 666 also suggest it could be Nero. The problem is, is, is Nero died 40 years before John wrote Revelation. And though Nero was still in the minds of the people, uh, I don't know that that was really what John had in mind. Another one that is very interesting is Domitian. Domitian was the Caesar in John's day. To get this one, you take, um, let me step back. When the emperor made coins in shorthand form, he would put his titles all around the, the edge of the coin. So you could, you could read all of the great things he, he was. Senator, general, uh, uh, head of the army, um, having the tri tri uh, uh, tri tribunician power. He was Pontifex Maximus. And as you take those letters uh, off, uh, and change them into uh, take yeah, and then change them into numbers. It comes out six sixty six. The problem with that one, I, and I, uh, the fellow who came up with that, I thought it was just absolutely brilliant. But as I uh, checked through, there was no coin in which all of those numbers are found. You have to uh, pick and choose. And I thought, well, that that weakens that one a little bit. Another uh, possibility is rather than being a man, it could be a people. If you take Romans and change it into Latins, Latinos in Greek, Latinos comes out as 666. And it goes on and on. Uh, there are two that appeal to me. Uh, one is the word beast. The Greek word for beast is therion. And if you translate that into Hebrew, it becomes terion, and if you work through the gematria on that one, it comes out 666. Uh, again, that's not the number of a man, but certainly it is the number of the power operating in the last days. I'm still a little skeptical. That's what John had in mind. But uh, as I have looked at this, I came to this conclusion. The number represents uh, a spiritual condition. As the mark and the number cannot be separated, so too the mark and the worship of the beast cannot be separated. The mark stands for the beast. In such a case, the number six would stand in contrast to the number seven, God's number. The number six would then be that which comes the closest to perfection, and 666 falls short in each of its digits. In that light, it represents a trinity of imperfection, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, as in chapters 12 and 13 of Revelation. Partaking of the mark then signifies spiritual devotion to the beast. It designates those who throughout time have been bitten by the serpent from the sea and who carry the venom in their veins. So in sum, the issue is really one of worship. God and Satan are playing for the hearts of the people because they want disciples. And each in these latter days 
is pushing forward with power. Both are playing for keeps. And therefore, we have to keep in mind exactly what's going on and to make sure that we play on God's side. Uh, society, I find, is not really rebelling. What society is doing is it's leaving the anchor of spirituality and it is now slouching toward Babylon. And fortunately, the end result of that is going to be traumatic. So just to kind of bring this to a close, I'll read one more piece. As of right now, the negative and horribly destructive for, uh, forces of climate change evident, evident everywhere act as but a precursor for what is coming. All serve as a united, if cacophonic voice, calling for the last time an intractable world to repentance. The volume is necessary so that the world cannot miss it. Even so, the message is indirect so that the inhabitants of the world must use the ear of faith to understand it. Most will not. Those with faith also understand that once God's judgments begin in earnest, there is no turning back, no time for repentance, only time for justice. The result will be Armageddon. In all this, it is evident, it, in all this, is it even possible that there is any good news? And the answer is an unequivocal and resounding yes but it comes with a major caveat. Only for the righteous is this a good period. Indeed, the world events will prove brutal for the wicked. On the other hand, for the true followers of Christ, and I believe for good people everywhere, not just Latter-day Saints, it will be a period in which they will see God and Christ moving more forcefully, more personally, into the uh, into on this onto the stage of history with miracles of all Old Testament portions becoming ever and ever more common. So that's kind of my conclusion. Uh, one of those pieces that um, to me was a nugget that I got of my studies of Revelation. Thank you. Could would you mind taking just a couple more minutes and? Um, sharing any insights on the 144,000. Oh, sure. Um, uh, let's let's do the gematria thing. We've mentioned this already. Three times four is 12. Okay, so uh, Godhead plus earth equals priesthood. We take a number, we multiply it by itself to really enhance that number. So 12 times 12 is 144. And then to show the perfective quality, then it's 144,000. We meet uh, these both in chapter 7 and 14. In chapter 7, uh, according to DNC 77, the 144,000 represents high priests. Uh, let me go back to chapter 7. In chapter 7, it represents 12,000 taken out of each one of the tribes, making 144,000 in Revelation. It says, no, it really, really represents high priests uh, who are called as the last missionary task force in the last days. And I believe that 144,000, because it's the fullness of priesthood, must include the matriarchal element as well as the patriarchal element. So I believe it is uh, men and women who are chosen in capacity as missionaries who will then, and I don't think there's going to be 144,000 of them. There could be fewer or more, but these are the, the element. Uh, uh, these are they who will be called because of the spiritual uh, quality they have and the fullness of the priesthood that they will work by in moving out and bringing all who will into the church of the firstborn. Uh, it's a different group in uh, chapter 14, and I don't uh, grammatically the Greek shows us it's a different group. The 144,000 in chapter 14 are, I believe, a much bar larger group than we find in chapter 7. And these are the Latter-day Saints whose lives are in order such that their hearts have become pure, 
and being pure, they are part of Zion, and therefore these are the, the solid core, the base and foundation of the building of Zion here in these last days. So would, it, would uh, in your opinion, would it be correct to say these are the kings and queens, priests and priestesses who come out of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and have absolutely the of priesthood? Yep, I absolutely believe that. This is, and uh, uh, we are losing uh, members of the church, and it just hurts me because I have some good friends who have, who have left the church. But uh, using the parables, it is the time of the net. Uh, Jesus says, I, what is it, Matthew 13? The, the net bringeth in all kinds, and then there is the sorting. of, uh, And we're going through that sorting period uh, such that, though the church is not growing as fast as I would like, uh, those who are staying true are even more spiritual, more powerful, more determined than before. Um, I have the privilege of being the state patriarch, and one of the, the tender things for me, as I've given patriarchal blessings, is the strength of many of these kids that are coming up in this last days. Um, before I was called as patriarch, I had, I have to admit a little, I always had faith the church was going to come through, but I was a little worried uh, we're using so many. But I'll tell you one thing that has been confirmed to me as a patriarch, and that is we have got a core of very powerful people, both adults and youth that are coming up. Yeah, it seems to me that uh even though you say the, the church numbers, maybe as far as baptisms, isn't growing like maybe we'd like to see, but the growth of temples is exponential. Isn't, isn't that astounding? And, you know, it would seem to me that that is part of this preparing the kings and queens and priests and priestesses to fulfill these roles. Oh, I think that's um, a wonderful insight. Yeah. Um, and that, that indicates me, to me that we are definitely living in the days that that nephi saw mm -hmm. he talks about the power the power of god in great glory yes coming upon the saints mm -hmm. so. yep it's it's a uh can be a frightening time to live unless we understand god's in charge and that he has set the limits and he is over his people and we follow the prophets we prepare and again uh, my message is, let's get out and proselytize as well. Let's get all we can back into the kingdom or get them into the kingdom. Well, that's uh, one of the reasons I began this this little podcast <laughs> that hopefully will grow as uh, we, we try to get the word out and, and uh, share ways that people can prepare themselves spiritually to survive in the days we're exactly living. Exactly right. That's what we need. <clears throat> Thank you for being with us on the Spiritual Survival Podcast. Again, if the mission of our podcast resonates with you, please click subscribe, like, and share this content.